Yes. All right, welcome everybody to this talk from Paul. Um, I'll just read this quick bio here. Um, Paul is an internationally acclaimed public speaker, developer, and science educator. Uh, he's well known for presenting a diverse range of topics, including privacy, neuroscience, and neuroethics, Klingon programming, open source, depression and mental health, advancements in science, diversity, autonomous agents, and minesweeper automation. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. His dynamic presentation style and quirky humour has delighted audiences worldwide. He's awarded the 2013 O'Reilly Open Source Award and the 2010 White Camel Award, both for outstanding contributions to the open source community. Thank you very much for that. Um, as a freedom-loving scientist, Paul's going to learn everything he can, do amazing things with that knowledge, and give them away for free. So I'm really looking forward to this talk, because if you were here in the previous talk, um, we are talking about social capital. And, and the reason I look forward to your talks is it's always interesting. I've seen them before. And I think this one will be also very interesting. Everyone, thank you for joining me, welcoming Paul. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me OK? Yes, awesome. So um, I, I know in the program this was uh, something about, you know, Kerbal Space Program, blah, blah, blah. Um, really, this is talking about building healthy open source communities in space. So um, this is not a talk. This is not going to work. This is not a talk about code. Um, uh, I am talking a little bit about software things in this. This is primarily a talk about community. Now, one of the important things about this is it's not just to talk about any sort of communities. It's not about your local board game club or whatever. I actually assume that you have code as part of your community, that you're working on a project, and that that project is open source. Um, if that's not the case, then not everything in here may apply to you, or more things may apply as well. The other thing which I'm assuming, and uh, this is a big assumption for some open source projects, is that you wish to attract and retain contributors. And I point that out because I see an awful lot of projects that seem to take active steps to uh, not attract contributors or to uh, get rid of the contributors they already have. And um, part of this comes from my frustration of seeing people turning contributors away, of uh, taking enthusiastic people and, and destroying their dreams. Um, so I also assume that you want your project to succeed. Now, this is a fairly important point because it is different to you succeeding. So these are all assuming that you want a healthy project, that that project can survive without you, that that project can hopefully flourish without you, um, that this is not all about your personal success. And I make a big point of that because one of the things which can get in the way of successful projects, particularly successful open source projects, is people's egos. This idea that, oh, it needs to be done my way, uh, or this needs to be done for my glory. And that's not what I'm going to be showing you here. It is also not a complete list of things to do. And because you're dealing with humans, and humans are very, very variable, um, you will have to use your best judgment for quite a lot of things. So I want to start off by talking um, a little bit about the, the personal psychology of starting an open source project. Um, and the very, very first time I started an open source project, I'm like, oh, I want to release this code. But releasing code is scary because you know, people might read my code, and then they'll judge me on it. And that's a really scary thing. Or people might not read my code, and then I'll feel that like I'm unimportant and my, my life's work is for nothing. Um, so releasing code is a fundamentally scary process. Um, admitting that you're wrong is also scary. Um, the first time I received a bug report, I was like, oh, no, I was wrong about this thing. And now I have to admit that I had this bug in my code or that my algorithm was not the best way of doing things. Um, and that's not very surprising, because I just learned Perl, and I decided to put every single trick I'd found into this project that I started and release it to the world. And the code was awful. Um, so there are lots of things which are wrong with that. The other thing which I see is that accepting code that you don't like, accepting contributions which are not in the exact form that you want can be scary. And I see a lot of people uh, who have pushback on like, oh, well, you've done it this way, and it works, and you know, it's bug free, but it's not the design that I would have liked, or you know, those sorts of things. And the result is that it's very easy to be over controlling. Uh, with projects. And I see this a lot where you have one person who's trying to exert too much control uh, on a project and its contributors, and the contributors go away because it's just terrible for them. They're being micromanaged. Um, so I actually have a simple rule which I use with my projects on whether or not I should accept a contribution. And it's a very, very simple one. It's very straightforward. Is it better than it was before? And that is essentially my only rule. So if I had a bug before, and with the contribution, that bug is now gone, and I have not incurred some extra level of technical debt from that, then I accept it. 
and I accept that even if it's not exactly the way that I would like to have written. Now, that doesn't mean forego you know, coding standards or forego quality or anything like that, um, but very much you want to be in the habit of accepting contributions if you can. And um, you can always say, hey, this is a great contribution. I'm just going to adjust the variable names so they match our code style. I'm going to replace those abominations you call tabs with spaces. I'm going to do all of those sorts of things. Um, but if it's better than it was before, please accept it. And for some things like documentation, wiki contributions, those sorts of things, this is a very easy bar to pass. So I'm going to be referring to the CCAN a little bit in this talk. Um, if you're wondering what the CCAN is, it's the Comprehensive Kerbal Archive Network. Um, I usually write it as KSP CCAN because there is another CCAN out there as well, which predates the Comprehensive Kerbal Archive Network, and it's used for entirely different things. So to try and make sure we don't end up with um, uh, confusion there, I tend to call this a KSP CCAN. Um, what it is, it's a mod manager for Kerbal Space Program. Um, it's completely free and open source. Uh, it's MIT licensed. It runs on every platform. Uh, it runs with everything. Um, and if you've never played Kerbal Space Program, it's a really pretty game if you can see that image. Um, what it looks like, it's, you know, it's this thing. You can select mods and everything and install them. There's command line interfaces. It's, this is not a talk about the code, so I'm really just uh, giving you a brief overview here. Um, suffice to say, it's apt-get for Kerbal Space Program. And when I say it's apt to get for Kerbal Space Program, we actually sat down with the Debian spec, and we said, how can we adapt this for Kerbal Space Program? So it does all of your dependencies and conflicts and recommends and so on and so forth. Um, it's almost one year old, and a lot of the stuff which I've learned in this talk come from this project. We have more than 200 contributors, and that is more than 200 contributors just by, by me running git short log minus sn. Uh, which gives you a summary of, of who's contributed to your code. So a ludicrous number of people have contributed to it. And we have more than 32,000 active users. Um, active users are people who have like downloaded or used it in the last couple of weeks. So um, this is a, a pretty big project as far as, as something I've done. Um, our metric is decades of human joy delivered. Um, that's what we're trying to maximize. And we have many decades of human joy that we have delivered. So things which I want to talk about, um, GitHub. Uh, who's using GitHub? <clears throat> Almost all of you, fantastic. Things which you probably know about GitHub, there's a readme file. You can put stuff in the readme file and people will see it when they go to your project page. One thing that a lot of people don't know about, you can have a contributing.md file. If you have a contributing.md file, whenever somebody opens up an issue or a pull request, they get this. Please review the guidelines for contributing to this policy, to, for this repository. And if they click on there, they get the contents of the contributing file. So this gives you a way that whenever you get any contribution at all, you can have a notice that's posted to users. So if you're using GitHub, have a contributing file. And I'll mention that a lot more as we go. Um, also, I recommend that you, instead of having a personal project, you make an organization. Um, this sort of means it's no longer, oh, this is Paul's project. It much more feels like this is our project. And you can give other people uh, administrative rights to that. It means that you can share the, um, the administrative load around, which is quite important. So one thing, if you're working on an open source project of any sort, um, if it's going to be successful, you know there will be certain problems that will occur in the future. Um, things like, you know, how do we uh, build releases? How do we do versioning? Um, how do we give people permission to stuff? But one thing that I find you will almost invariably end up with any sort of community is a level of inappropriate behavior. And this is something you want to be thinking about now and fixing now, because fixing this when it's already a problem is very, very hard. Uh, you can have communities where you have some sort of bad behavior which is occurring. Other people see that's acceptable. Trying to change the course of that community is very, very hard. And very often, people don't uh, try or they, they, they try and fail. And you end up with a community where you need a thick skin to contribute here. And the moment I hear you need a thick skin to contribute here, what I think is our community is toxic. This is not a nice place for you to be, and you will find that people will disappear from your community, they will leave, or they will not join in the first place. So because it is so hard to change an existing community, I recommend you get it right from the start. And the easiest way of doing this, don't just have a readme and a contributing file, have a code of conduct as well. And your code of conduct should clearly define the expectations for your project. Um, what is uh, something that is you know, a good thing to be doing in your project? What is allowed? What is absolutely not allowed? And um, I was actually reading one the other day. I think it was the Rust language. 
uh, code of conduct. And I thought it made a very, very uh, nice distinction in there. It said that in this project, swearing is OK, but swearing at people is not. So if your machine falls over, sure, you can swear that's completely appropriate. But if you're swearing at another person, that's not appropriate. And I thought that was a, a very nice and clear distinction. One thing a code of conduct does as well is it makes it clear that you actually care about the safety of your contributors. Um, a standard code of conduct will include things like, hey, harassment is unacceptable, stalking is unacceptable. Um, if you're talking to someone and they don't want to talk to you, then you know, please stop talking to them, those sorts of things. And um, part of the side effect of that, of caring about the safety of your contributors and showing that you're serious, is you tend to attract better contributors. Um, people who are nicer to work with, people who work better as a group. Um, the people who want to have a project with bad behavior tend not to turn up in the first place, which is really, really nice. Now, like a license, don't write your own. Um, many people have written codes of conduct before. This, this uh, conference has a code of conduct, the Linux Australia Code of Conduct. There are many other ones out there. Um, I'm very, very fond of the citizencodeofconduct.org. Um, it is a Creative Commons template. It has bits where you can insert your project name here, um, where you can fill in extra things. It's what we use in the CCAN. I think it's fantastic. I suggest you put that in your IRC topic or anywhere that you have a, um, a communication hub for your community so everyone is aware that there is a code of conduct. And it means if you ever need to you know, boot someone off IRC because they're being a terrible person, it's very clear that you know, the code of conduct has applies. Um, we've got that in our contributing file. And in fact, if you uh, click on the contributing file, uh, what do you need to know if you're contributing to this project? It's the very, very first thing that we have. And we have a, um, a short summary. Primary goal of the CCAN is to be inclusive of the largest number of contributors with the most varied uh, backgrounds as possible. And uh, we also talk about how to report bugs, um, how to make contributions, um, how to submit metadata, which is you know, the various things which I'm going to be, uh, uh, the users might do. I also recommend if you're going to have a code of conduct, and you please do, include it in your induction processes. So um, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but when somebody turns up to your project and you want to add them to a contributor, get them to read the code of conduct, make sure that they agree to it, and then remind them that they can enforce the code of conduct. And um, this one's very, very important. If everyone feels they have the ability to enforce this, then if you have a violation, and normally you're not adding people as sort of uh, top-level contributors, unless you're, you're pretty sure they're the right sort of people, if you have a violation, then it can de be dealt with very, very quickly. And um, we had one with the, uh, the CCAN a few weeks ago, and I didn't even was aware that we had a violation because we had two independent people say, hey, this is absolutely not cool, and they shut down the threat. And it was the correct thing to do, and it was wonderful, and we didn't have an endless discussion because of that. The other thing is have a license. Um, I know everyone says have a license, uh, but I keep seeing people go, oh, I want to contribute to this project, but I'm not sure what the license is, and I don't know uh, what that means for me being able to take this project with my contributions and running with it. So please put a license on your code. I don't actually, uh, I'm not going to give you recommendations here as to which, uh, because there's a website for that, chooseolicense.com. And um, if you're unsure about licenses, go to here in like two or three easy steps. It can give you a suggested license, and it will probably be the one you want. Um, put that in a standard spot because people uh, go looking for licenses and also require contributions to your project to be under the same license. Um, that just keeps things nice and clear. Um, so we use an MIT license with the CCAN. It's a very permissive license. It allows sub-licensing. But if you're sending a pull request or a contribution to our repository, it has to also be under the MIT license. So that way, anyone's forking our repository, we know that everything's going to be licensed the same way. And put that stuff in your contributing file as well. One thing that I also want to talk about is excluding contributors by accident. And this is a really difficult thing to see happen, because if you're doing this by accident, then by definition, you're not aware that it's happening. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, I was involved with a, a project a little while ago um, that had weekly public video conferences uh, with all of the people who were involved with the project. Um, and this was a great idea. This meant that they could talk face to face. Uh, members of the public could see what was going on. People could drop by and, and sort of get feedback and everything. And these were also publicly archived as well. So you could sort of catch up on them if you're on a, a different time zone. So this was a nice idea. Um, but the problem with this is it was also the primary way in which decisions were made. And uh, that meant that you did exclude people from that decision-making process. The very straightforward one is 
if the, if the meetings are at the wrong time for you, if you are at work, if you're on a bus, if you were otherwise committed at the time, you couldn't attend. And uh, that was definitely the case if you were in a different time zone. Me being in Australia, uh, what is a good time uh, in Silicon Valley is not necessarily a good time in Melbourne. But it excluded a whole lot of other people as well that you might not think about. Anyone with hearing difficulties probably can't participate in a video conference where people are primarily talking with speech. Um, if you have somebody who is sitting in a coffee shop and they're working from the coffee shop, it is immensely annoying if somebody in the coffee shop with their laptop puts on their headphones and starts talking into a, a Hangout or a Skype session and bothering everyone else. So most people don't do that because most people aren't jerks. So you know, you're excluding people who have other humans around them that might not want to hear that conversation. But the other thing this excluded is uh, people who were uh, victims of internet harassment um, appearing in a very, very public channel that anyone could join that was then archived in a public place as well was actively dangerous to these people. And that actually made up a large percentage of the user base for this particular project. And um, it wasn't a situation that you know, video conferences are bad. It was a case that this is a decision-making process and is the primary uh, decision-making process. Um, we were unaware of who was being excluded. And that's a, a real danger, and it's a very, very hard thing to combat. And what you can end up with is a situation known as homogeneity inertia. Uh, Greta Christina has a wonderful essay that I recommend to like everyone on the planet every six months. Um, uh, homogeneity inertia is where you end up with everyone in the project being more or less the same, and then just due to the fact that everyone is the same, it continues on that way. And one of the ways that that continues is the fact that we're unaware of who we're excluding from our project, completely unaware of that. So one of the solutions for this, as far as I'm concerned, the best solution for this, is if at all possible, start with diverse leadership. Start with diverse leadership when it comes to race, gender, operating systems, skill sets, socioeconomic status. Um, if you have people who speak languages other than English, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, start with as much diverse leadership as you possibly can. And then in a situation where you might exclude contributors by accident, hopefully somebody can pick up on that. This is a very, very powerful way of making sure you have a diverse set of contributors. That's not always going to be possible. A lot of the time, uh, open source projects start with individual people. Um, and in that case, out outreach uh, can be quite important. Find people who are not like yourself and encourage them to participate in your project. And um, there are lots of good organizations out there that help you with this. Um, Outreachy is a, quite a good one. Uh, OpenHatch, if anyone's seen OpenHatch, is essentially a, a way that you can, uh, contributors can find easy bugs to solve and you can sort of connect with potential contributors. Um, on that note, uh, please don't stand in the way of people being creative. Um, I see this an awful lot where people try to do awesome things and then they get told, no, you can't do that. Um, if you have first timers, make them feel welcome. The very, very first time somebody turns up in the project, say, hey, welcome to the project. Um, here are resources which you might want. Here's our wiki. Here's our FAQ. Um, here's our guidelines for contributing. Here's our IRC channel if you haven't found that yet. Um, make sure that they feel welcome and that they're interacting with other people. Um, one thing which I've also seen work here, believe it or not, is having a bot do the welcoming process. Um, so the Rust language actually has a bot, I think it's called High Five. And um, the first time somebody comes in with a pull request, the bot's like, hey, you're sending us a pull request. This is awesome. And sort of walks them through things they might need to think about and also alerts a, uh, a sort of a, a, a higher level, more senior contributor um, that we've got a person here with a pull request. So those two people can talk and work together. One of the nice things about welcoming people is that it is leading by example. You end up with a lot of people who will welcome others. They know that this is a project where you welcome new contributors and people are like, oh yeah, here's someone new, let me welcome them to the project. The other thing which I want to stress is, um, if at all possible, give people the permissions they need to do their job. Um, anytime you find somebody who is like waiting on something to happen because they don't have permissions to do that, consider giving them those permissions. Um, most people, uh, when they sort of get serious enough about the project, are quite competent. Um, most people want to be doing the right thing, and this is the thing I've found most of all, which helps projects grow, is you go, great, you're on the project here. I'm giving you a commit bit to the repository, or I'm giving you access to this. Um, part of that, have an induction process. Um, our induction process includes the code of conduct, but also explaining to people that we have a very flat structure. Pretty much anyone can do anything, um, and you should do whatever it is that you feel comfortable with. 
The other thing which we have with the induction process is if you're going to be making a change to code, to build processes, um, to anything which might affect our users, um, have another human check that over first. So essentially making sure that you don't end up with people, there's only one person who knows how things work, and um, simply having code review catches a lot of bugs. Part of that also comes down to encourage helping others. Um, hey, great, you're a contributor. We have these pull requests. You have the power to do code review and to integrate those if you feel comfortable doing so. And usually new contributors want a little bit of hand-holding. Once they feel confident, they start doing amazing things. Um, included in that is encourage decision-making. Uh, it's very easy for people to say, oh, this is the clear leader of the project and all important decisions must come from them. The problem is if you ever want to go on holidays, uh, if you ever get burnt out, if you ever run out of time, you become an enormous bottleneck and you don't want to be that enormous bottleneck. So try to distribute roles as much as you can. Try to distribute leadership as much as you can. Try to make it so that you are replaceable is the big thing I want to, uh, to stress here. And in fact, because you have an open source project with code, um, one of the best things that you can have are robust development processes. And um, this effectively protects your code and your users from your contributors, including yourself. So I'm glad to see how many people here are using GitHub, um, because Git makes it really easy to roll things back. It's very, very easy to say, oh, we've put this thing in here. We discovered you know, two weeks later that this was actually a mistake. It makes it relatively straightforward compared to most other versioning systems to roll something back, to remove something if it was put in there um, incorrectly. Um, having continuous integration, having uh, bots which are always testing your code on a variety of platforms, a variety of operating systems, a variety of environments, this can give you uh, a lot of surety that you haven't introduced bugs that you didn't expect. And it can be great for people sending you contributions because your pull requests will come up with, hey, this passes our test suite. Or, hey, this has a problem if you're running it under Windows with this version of, you know, of our environment. So you can immediately get that sort of feedback. Um, and this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Travis, if you have not encountered Travis, uh, is great. But there's a lot of other continuous integration systems out there as well. And Travis for open source projects is free for GitHub users. Pull requests and code review. Um, it's good sort of engineering practice uh, to have code reviewed before it hits the repository. Um, so we actually have a requirement that any changes to our code uh, are reviewed by a human, even if it's from one of our core contributors. Um, just to make sure that you know, people get a chance to review that. Um, the code review is an amazing way to learn things. And again, this gives you more robust processes. You can distribute leadership more because you have much, much lower risks. And um, it's also very easy to have uh, projects where the release for your code, whatever that release is, is known by one person and it relies upon them being on their laptop. And if that person's not around, you can't release the code. Um, release automation, where you press one button and you have a bot build all of your releases and upload them to your release page and everything else, this is absolutely magical and again protects you from a lot of potential harm. And uh, we do that with the CCAN as well. If you look at our Travis file, you can see how we're doing that. Um, it's fabulously straightforward. In terms of getting new contributors, entry-level tasks are amazing. Um, if somebody turns up to your project and says, I want to help, you want something they can help with. And with almost every project I've seen, there is an endless number of things they could help with, even if the people running the project are unaware of those. And one thing to be aware of is that helping does not need to be code. Um, support is one of those things that we have endless amount of things which need to be done. We have more than 35,000 users. Um, a percentage of those need help in some way. Just having people doing basic answering using que user questions is amazing. We have a huge number of tickets in GitHub, a huge number of issues. Simply sitting down and classifying those. This is a bug in the core. This is a bug that only exists on Mac systems. Um, this is something which is high priority. This is something which requires a change to the spec for us to be able to integrate. That sort of basic classification is incredibly valuable, and new people can do it. It's very, very straightforward. Sharing experiences. Um, having somebody just say, hey, here is how I use your software, this is really, really valuable. Getting those user stories, um, getting those into wikis, getting them into forums, getting where people see them. People go, oh, wow, I didn't know that I could use this before, or that's a great idea. That is a form of contribution that's very valuable. And what that ties into is things like writing docs. Um, we always want documentation. Uh, you want your newbies to be writing that documentation because they're the people who are encountering uh, the bits where they might not be sure about things. They've hit all those rough edges. Updating the wiki, so on and so forth. 
Newbies are absolutely fantastic. I love newbies and projects. They see the rough edges. They find the things which don't work. They find the barriers for new contributions, and they can tell you about them. In our case, we have an enormous amount of metadata that we sling around. Um, every mod has instructions on here is how you install that mod for, for our system. Uh, here is where you fetch it from. Here's how you index it, so on and so forth. And these are small JSON documents. Um, most of them are maybe five or six lines long. And they're very, very easy for a new contributor to pick up because they're like, oh, here's this template I can use. Here's the stuff which I can fill in. Um, they get a feel that they can do this. And then they go, great, I can now add all of my other favorite mods to the CCAN, or I can fix up these bugs which I found. The other thing which I cannot stress enough is if somebody comes to you asking for support, how do I do this? I've found a bug. Um, this doesn't work quite right, so on and so forth. Encourage them to contribute and empower them to do so. So I'll get a lot of people saying, hey, um, can we get this mod indexed in the CCAN? And I'm like, absolutely we can. If you feel comfortable um, with, uh, with our processes, um, then here is how you do this. Here is our new contributor's guide on how to add a mod. If you don't feel comfortable with that or if we don't have enough time, yep, we'll add that to our list of things to do. And enough people go, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. And because they've got somebody there helping them, they discover it's easy, and suddenly they've become a contributor. So if you can get people to say, great, you've got a problem, here's how you can fix it, and it's not a patches welcome, it is an actual honest to goodness, I would like to help you do this, and if not, then I'll fix it. Um, that is very, very great for getting contributors. And um, of course, recognize non-code contributors, the people on your forums, everywhere else. Um, recognize people who report problems. Uh, when a bug comes in, you now know that your code has a bug. So please do not be like, oh, what are you doing reporting this bug? This is unimportant, blah, blah, blah. Say, thank you so much for reporting this bug. It's really great that we know about this now. And maybe you don't have time to fix it immediately, but acknowledge that this is valuable, getting information about those bugs. Um, also, people who say thank you, people who help others, uh, people who update the docs, all of those people, go out of your way to thank them. Um, they are making your life much, much easier in building your community. And in fact, I'd almost say with any project at all, if I could choose, you know, who could I have, you know, I can have one amazing person on my project, um, what would that amazing person be? I would say that that should be a community manager. Community managers for me are more valuable than anyone else because they are the people who will get us new contributors, um, who will get us more users, who will make sure that we have a very, very healthy community and by a consequence of that, a very, very healthy project. Um, I would much rather have a great community manager than a great coder uh, because great coders will just find their way in. Great community managers are really hard to find and they're amazing. Um, on that note, I'm gonna uh, have a call out to Octohat. Uh, Katie's project that she mentioned yesterday in the Lightning Talks, um, it lets you run through uh, GitHub and find people who haven't contributed to code but have contributed in other ways, and it's very, very good. Um, on that note, whenever possible, also try to advance the status of others. Um, if you ever look at the release notes of uh, any CCAN release, um, it is practically this sort of long liturgy of here are all these people who are amazing because they made this release happen. And um, you know, this person fixed this bug, this person updated the spec, this person did these things. Um, it keeps your contributors around. They feel valuable, they feel acknowledged for what they do. Um, part of this also is uh, let's all build hat racks. Um, don't just contribute to people, uh, don't just acknowledge people on your uh, local space, on your forums, on your release notes and everything. Go to places like LinkedIn and say, hey, this person is great at what they do. Um, I have made a project for the CCAN, um, so in terms of, you know, here are my job roles and everything, it's not just, oh, you know, I've got this programming job, it's I have, you know, found a for this project, and then I can say this person worked with me on this project, and this is why they're wonderful, and this is their skills, and this is how they saved the day multiple times, and I'm very, very glad to say that the CCAN has got people jobs. So we have, and this is one of the best and worst things ever, we have lost contributors because their amazing work in the CCAN has scored them their dream job. And that is absolutely awesome. And one of these days, they're going to get a job at a space agency, and then I'm going to get to hang out with them um, in that space agency, which is great. But we also have people actively headhunting um, our contributors, which I encourage. Like people come in and it's like, wow, this person has consistently done an amazing job. I get reports from our contributors that, you know, this person wants to hire me because they saw me do all this work on this. And this person asks if I can take this position because they've seen these things. So open source contributions absolutely advance people's professional careers and you want to help them do that. 
Um, one thing that I think is very important, and again, this comes down to making sure your ego doesn't get in the way, um, try not to be the person who knows everything. If you have that one person who knows everything and has an opinion on everything, it's not very nice for everyone else. And in my case, this was super, super easy um, because the CCAN was my very first project in C Sharp. I had never programmed in C Sharp before. And in fact, my, my background for the last 15, 20 years was almost entirely with dynamic languages. Um, you know, Perl and Ruby and a little bits of other languages in there. Um, it had been a long time since I'd been coding in a strongly typed static language. So I knew nothing about how C Sharp worked. And also C Sharp does things in a lot of sort of Windowsy Microsoft ways. And I have a strong Unix background. So the result of this is that I launched a project where it was my learning project. This was my first time working with this language. And um, most of the code that I wrote were regular expressions because they were almost the same way as you do things in Perl. And people would come across like this four line, four line long regular expression and say, what are you doing, Paul? And I'm like, I don't know how to do this in C Sharp. Please save me. And of course, people would. And it was wonderful. And the result was that all of my uh, contributors, code contributors, knew way more than I did about practically every aspect of this uh, build environment that we're working with and the languages that I'm working with. And I've learned an awful lot from them. This has been one of the best learning experiences I've ever had because I've had amazing people come in and talk to me about it. So you know, take their advice. Um, if someone says, hey, it would be really good if we did things this way, there's a good chance that they actually know what they're talking about. Um, learn from them and also remind others that you might be wrong. And again, this is empowering other people to take leadership. I will say, hey, I think we should do things this way, but I have this limited background. So maybe there are better ways of doing this. Now, on that note, I want to do an enormous shout out here to Lumio. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has encountered Lumio before. Um, this goes far beyond open source projects. In fact, um, I find this is most useful uh, with sort of community projects. You're uh, starting a, a charity, or you have a board gaming club, or you have those sorts of things. Lumio is all about, uh, Lumio is all about getting people to make consensus-based decision making. So getting people to work together to find the best way to make decisions and move forward. And I absolutely adore it, and it's open source, and it's community driven, and it is, I have enormous love for Lumio. The last thing which I want to mention, and this is very, very important for me, and this is the hardest thing for me personally, is do not beat yourself up. If you have a successful open source project, it will be not just a full-time job, it will be more than a full-time job. There will be much more happening with that project than you could ever hope to, to cover. And um, I guarantee that you will make mistakes. You will have times where you say, gosh, I wish I did that differently. Um, I could have handled that better. I wish I had seen that thing. Um, you will make mistakes. Um, you, I guarantee, will need a break. Uh, there will be times where, whether you intend to or not, you will let other people down. And if you have a successful enough project, you will be criticized. There will be people who do not agree with what your software was doing, uh, what your decisions were, um, you know, whether or not you're making the world a better place. You will be criticized given a successful enough project. And my advice for that is to simply say, it's OK. These things will happen. These things are part of having a successful project. And it is OK to take time out. It is OK to look after yourself. It's OK to take a break if you need it. And one of the most important things of having a successful, healthy community is that it lets you do that, that other people can run things even if you need to take time offline. So everybody, thank you very, very much for listening to me. Um, I have a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, online. This talk is entirely uh, open source as well, so you can find it online. And uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for questions, and otherwise I will be around at lunchtime. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. So we certainly do have about 10 minutes for questions before lunch. Uh, any questions? Uh, roughly, how many um, contributors are there to, to this program? Um, so with the CCAN, we have, um, I say, more than 200. 
uh, because it's super, super easy for me to do basic metrics. Um, we have for, for metadata contributions, we have about 230, I would say. Uh, for code contributions, we have maybe uh, 60, 65 people. Um, and then we have hundreds more people who have posted to the forums, um, who have like, you know, done support on Reddit, who have uh, opened issues and all of those sorts of things. Um, so if I was to sort of total up all of your contributions, I would guess around about three or 400, um, but that is a rough estimate. So absolutely more than 200, uh, probably less than 400 would be my, my range. I'll ask a question then. Yes. Um, so I work on the F-Droid project, and we're getting a little bit better at sort of um, giving commit access to people when they contribute and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, but one thing that we're still going to struggle with always is we're building apps for people, those apps need to be signed with a security key, and there's only mm -hmm. ever one person who can do that, because mm -hmm. it's an offline security key. If he gets hit by a bus, I have no idea what happens to the project. We may have to start again with a new key, mm -hmm. but that's very much the nature of that work. I can't think of a way to flatten that structure but, so that there's less bottlenecks. In that, um, in that case, if you can have somebody else who has a signing key but does not use it, so that if you have your first, being, per, first person being hit by the bus, the second one can keep on going, that is fantastic. Um, but it comes down to, and this is one of those hard things, it's like I, I need to give someone else permission to do this, and that can actually be a, a, a hard thing to, to overcome. Yeah, very much it's because it's not me who has the key. Um, I don't want to ask somebody in the UK to mail me <clears throat> something like that or no. to send it to somebody <laughs> else. So it's going to be a matter of someone physically traveling there and asking permission to do that, which then he has to watch your talk to understand the benefits of all of this stuff, <laughs> rather than just holding all of this stuff to himself. Mm -hmm. all right, so I'm sure Paul will be around if you want to ask any questions later on. Um, thank you very much again, Paul. Very cool. enjoyable talk. Thank you. And here's a gift from the conference organizers as well. Thank you.